Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speakers. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Uh, today we're honored to host Dr. Cheryl Racinos, who is a family physician working as a hospitalist in California. Mm -hmm. She began her career as a community college student in Los Angeles and then transferred to UCLA. She initially became a high school science teacher before finally pursuing her dream of attending medical school. Dr. Racinos started at Ross University when she was 31 and a wife and mother of three. Her journey as a non-traditional student and survivor of significant traumas, including running away, foster care, incarceration, and homelessness, gave her unique insights into treating undeserved patients. She is a strong advocate for breaking down barriers to studying medicine and mentorship, as well as the author of the award-winning memoir, Hindsight, Coming of Age on the Streets of Hollywood, which chronicles her teenage years. She currently serves as a first alumni member on the board of directors for My Friend's Place, a homeless youth program in Hollywood. Dr. Rosinas, thank you for joining us today. Hi there, I'm so honored to join you and I can't wait to talk with all of you. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, do I have the share screen ability? Yes, you do. Yes, okay. Sorry, my desktop is a mess. I do apologize. Um, yeah. This is, sorry, it's not acting up the way I like. Let me show. Okay, All right, so we're going to talk tonight about some of my experiences and how that relates to the broad experiences that many of you are, are going through or have gone through as you're working towards um, getting into medical school. Um, by far, I, I haven't met very many other physicians with the extent of, you know, childhood trauma that I, I survived, but I do know quite a few that have, you know, snippets of overlap with what I went through. And so I'm not the only person you'll meet along this way um, with the kind of stories that I have, and hopefully you don't have those same stories, but if you do, we'll talk about what that means as we go through the presentation. Um, as they said, I'm a family medicine hospitalist. I live in Los Angeles. I'm currently working in a locums capacity, meaning like travel physician, and my current assignment is in Fresno. Okay, for disclosures, I am an independent author. Um, I do have a published memoir that they mentioned. Um, I know some people get concerned about things like that because of finances. I donate a lot of money, and so I don't want anyone to feel wary about you know, money or anything like that. I donate far more than I make on the book. I actually enjoy doing that. Um, our agenda tonight, I'm going to give you some of my backstory and talk about my pre-med um, journey as well as medical school and residency. 
And then I have some very specific med school and life pearls I'd like to share with you. And when we get to the pearls section, those are things that no one ever told me that I wish somebody had told me before I started medical school. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. I have a lot of pictures in here just to kind of give you some reference. And we're starting with the picture with the bad haircut. So <laughs> for my backstory, um, I, I came from a family that was incredibly dysfunctional. Um, I grew up in North Carolina and I was the youngest of five children. Um, unfortunately, when I was five, one of my siblings was sent away to foster care. He was 13. Um, when he left, the rest of us stayed. And that's very unusual for one kid to be taken away. And he was kind of scapegoated as a bad kid. And my dad turned to me and said, you're just like him. So starting at five years old, I tried to run away because I knew that I was eventually going to be pushed out. It was just a recipe for problems. My mom was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, my dad, I presume, is a narcissist. He was very controlling. And my first stepmom was very depressed and ended up requiring hospitalization. Um, she actually had the same psychiatrist as my mom. And so all of that tells you that I wasn't coming from a normal, regular family. So unfortunately, as we started to move through, we can't really see the, the picture. Should I change the screen? Or... No, it's fine. We can see it. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. It's got it. Um, so unfortunately, with what was happening, um, when I went to go see my stepmom in the hospital at 11, um, she was newly married to my dad for maybe five or six months at the time. Um, my dad allowed the psychiatrist to place me on the adolescent side. And there really wasn't a reason for that, but they did. And I was abused within the hospital system for two and a half months before I was sent home. And that started you know, a chain of events where I started running away looking for safety in places that weren't at home. I first ran away locally and I kept going back. And so at 13, I got the bright idea to run away very far. And I ran away from North Carolina to California. And that was something that cost money. At the time, I didn't know of other methods to get across the country. And so I stole money from my dad to make the journey possible. Um, I took $250 and I bought a bus ticket. When I got to Los Angeles, you know, it was a place I picked on the map. I was a little kid and I didn't know what I was doing. And I said, you know, that looks pretty far away. I didn't know Hollywood was in Los Angeles. I just knew Los Angeles was on the other side of the country. And I was trying to get away from a bad situation. After a couple of weeks in Los Angeles, I was arrested as a runaway. A lot of the homeless youth workers were very nervous about my age because, you know, a lot of things can happen to a 13 year old. And so they quickly turned me into the police for being a runaway. And I got sent back. But when I was sent back, I wasn't placed back in my dad's care. I was placed into foster care. And once I was in foster care, you know, I, I started running again. They wouldn't let me talk to my mom. And she was my one person where I felt like I had an adult who loved me and cared about me. And I wasn't allowed to communicate with her, call her, visit with her because my dad had been my guardian. And so they decided that I couldn't see her. And for me, that was the catalyst. I just kept leaving. I didn't feel safe and I didn't feel like I was being heard. After a couple more times running away, my dad pressed charges for that money I had stolen. Because it was $250 as a minor, I was given up to two years in maximum security prison. I ended up serving 10 months and I'll tell you those 10 months were horrific. You know, the first night I was there, I was attacked um, by multiple girls in the shower. And the, the, the violence continued for several months. It's something that to this day um, still causes a certain amount of like PTSD type symptoms. And, and that's largely why I'm an advocate against, you know, all of this mass incarceration we have for young people, especially in our country. And, and it's something we need to think about as we go into the medical field. And we'll get to that later. But if you think about this story, and then you think about someone who's in prison, I was around a bunch of traumatized kids who had similar upbringings, similar you know, challenges, dysfunctional families, and they had no hope and they were placed in this system that wouldn't protect them. And so these are a lot of the patients you'll see when you go into medicine. And just remember, you know, they didn't all start with that you know, media story that we all hear. Sometimes it's something very benign like running away from home. 
when I was released from prison, I was released back into my dad's custody. Foster care placed me back in his custody while I was there with no changes, no, you know, counseling for him. Everything was geared towards making me behave better when there weren't really behavior issues to address. You know, I was a good student, um, went to school, did my work, got A's and B's. You know, I was in clubs. I was very excited about school and my future, but this thing kept happening with my family. And, you know, at 14, when I went home, now since I was out of prison, I didn't really have a lot of options and I couldn't leave because I had um, probation and I didn't want to go back. And so I had a suicide attempt because I was terrified of, of staying and I didn't really know what else to do. And so at 14, I, I didn't see a future. All of that kind of dissolved. Fortunately, I survived. And, you know, eventually my dad and my stepmom broke up, but things didn't get better. And when I was 16, I came home one night and my dad told me he wanted me to leave. By then I'd been through so much and I had so much unaddressed trauma that all he had to do was say the words and I left. And I eventually made my way back to California where I stayed. And so all of that is to say that a lot had happened before I got to California. You know, I wasn't a normal kid, but I also wasn't a bad kid. You know, I had a lot going on when I hit the streets. Um, the main picture you see here is one of my friends. Um, this was a photo that was taken at one of the squats we stayed in. The streets were safer than home. Um, squats are primarily places like abandoned buildings or places that are not being used for housing or for whatever their purpose is. And people stay there sometimes. In this case, um, if you're from the Los Angeles area or you've been through here, this was in front of Pantages Theater in that little area where they have the, the ticket sales when you first go in. They were closed back in the 90s and whoever was taking care of the theater allowed us to sleep there at night. And so that was my home for a summer. I stayed there. I stayed in abandoned buildings at unsafe locations. Sometimes I would couch surf. Um, I walked all night sometimes stayed in lifeguard towers, um, on and off in shelters, but they usually only let us stay for about two or three weeks at a time. And, you know, I made a few attempts to get off the streets. I did get a job when I was 18 and I did get my first apartment. I started college. I started taking community college classes in business and I was so excited about my future. And I couldn't afford the books. I didn't qualify for, for financial aid because I was considered um, a dependent student because I was 18 and I didn't hit any of the qualifiers at that time for being independent. Fortunately now, homelessness counts as a qualifier. And if I were going to college in today's system, I would have qualified, but back then I did not. So I was taking classes without books, working full time and trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And then I did this silly thing and I got pregnant. So it made things a lot harder. Um, I ended up only taking that first semester and then taking a break because I was very pregnant and housing fell apart. And I ended up back on the streets of Hollywood, um, staying again in unsafe places. There were a couple months where I stayed in the McDonald's 24 hour um, location that was on Hollywood and Highland. A lot of people slept there at night. And then when I had um, gotten to a point of about seven or eight months pregnant, I ran into a friend who let me go stay with her for a while. When my first child was born, Roxana, where you see in the picture at the bottom, um, I asked a friend to let me go stay with him and I rented his sofa for a few months while I tried to figure it out. And I never was on the streets again after that. I went from his house to a young mom's program in Hollywood and then moved in with my now husband, the father of my kid, um, when she was about eight months old. And it was a very tough journey. That poor guy has had to put up with me for a very long time. Um, but I've had to put up with him too. We both came from very traumatized backgrounds. You know, trauma meets trauma. And so a lot of people who have been through traumatic experiences tend to pair up with a partner who has similar trauma experiences. And so it can be very, very difficult in those first few years. Somehow we made it work. So after 19, that's when I hit the ball rolling. You know, I wanted something different from my kid than what I had experienced. And the only place where I could find that was in community college. 
you know, I was a student at Los Angeles Valley College and I loved it there. I had never found a place that just accepted me so easily. And, you know, I had professors that really worked with me, except for one guy. There's always one guy. But I had um, an English professor who loved my baby. You know, I showed up for class one day because I had fired the babysitter and I brought my child with me when she was about two and a half or three months old. And halfway through class, he heard her coo. And he was so surprised that there was a baby. And then he said, you know, you can bring her whenever you need to. And I ended up taking three of his classes and I had to bring her a couple more times. And he was always very kind. You know, there were a lot of great supportive professors along the way, and I'm still friends with a few of them. And that's important because when I was in the hospital with that baby, when I delivered her, my goals changed. Until I became 18, my only goal was to be alive. I didn't think I'd make it past 18. And when I became 19 as a mom, my goal was to somehow get through it without her ending up in CPS or foster care. But when I had her, I was in the hospital and, you know, I was kind of afraid of hospitals because of that whole experience I had as a teenager and then getting re-hospitalized when I had my suicide attempt. But something was different that time. And when I was there, it felt like home in a way that I couldn't really put to words. And I just knew that I was supposed to be there and I was supposed to be a doctor. And I couldn't figure out why. And it took me a very long time to figure out why. But because I had that feeling, I chased it. I started taking honors classes and I took some classes that were way too hard and I struggled in places where I shouldn't have. I, I was able to get my transfer. When I applied for transfer, I was thinking at the time that I would go after like a social science degree and then maybe think it over and see if I really wanted to be a doctor. And so I put my application and I got accepted to three, med sorry, to three um, undergrads. I got accepted to UCLA, to UC Irvine and UC San Diego. And the only reason I chose UCLA was because UC Irvine and UC San Diego both wanted a hundred dollar seat deposit and I didn't have a hundred dollars. And so I said, okay, I guess I'm going to UCLA. But that semester I'd had a change of heart. And I was thinking, you know, I really, want to take another year at community college so I can get those pre-med classes because maybe I'm going too fast and maybe that's what I really want after all. But because it's me, I found out I was pregnant with my second kid and I needed the financial aid package at UCLA. So I said, why not? I'll just go ahead and transfer to UCLA way ahead of schedule. And so I got there with the hope to do a double major and, you know, not just one kid, but I also, I'm an overachiever. I took custody of my niece, my husband's niece. And then we had a Metro strike. And so I'm driving everybody everywhere, including my now middle school niece that we're taking care of. And I've got my kid, I'm pregnant. And I'm also working because why not? I did okay in community college. I can still keep getting those A's and B's. And I struggled. At UCLA in my first quarter, I took classes that I shouldn't have been in. And I didn't realize that I didn't have the prerequisites until about halfway through the quarter for one of my classes. And I was holding my chemistry book when I walked through and they thought I was the TA because there's no way I should have been taking the chemistry level I was at if I was in that class. And I didn't figure it out until that comment. And then I went back and I checked, but I had inadvertently found like the one wrong code that got me into the class. So needless to say, I ended up on academic probation after my first quarter. And I was terrified. You know, I'd, I'd finally gotten to this spot where I thought I was going to get where I needed to go. And I no longer had those professors next to me giving me guidance because, you know, in the community college setting, it's a smaller class. And I didn't have that. And I was incredibly pregnant and trying to figure out what to do. So fortunately, my professor from the community college at LA Valley College, she um, offered me a job. She said that I could start working in the tutoring lab instead of my other job that I had. So I would have a more appropriate, you know, science type job. And so I started tutoring science instead. She let me wait until after I'd had the baby and after I'd had a little bit of time off before I started that job, but it was something that I could hold on to. So I had a better place to go that was more aligned with what I wanted. And I started taking, you know, appropriate classes so that I could be in a class that was at the right level. 
when I did finally get my double major approved, I was trying to do sociology and microbiology. I was finally approved for the double. And then I found out that the childcare subsidy that I had gotten onto to pay for childcare for both of my kids got canceled. And I was at the end of my second year there. And I sat down and I looked at the calendar and I looked at the schedule of classes. And I said, you know, I can't afford to stay in school anymore. That's what always ended up happening. I couldn't afford something. There was some financial barrier and I really didn't know how to get the resources I needed. And so I decided that the degree I was closest to was sociology, even though I still had, you know, all those science classes I'd already taken and I needed seven more classes to graduate. And, you know, I don't know how I did it, but I took seven classes that summer and I graduated. And I didn't know what I was going to do with that degree. But again, my biology teacher from community college said, hey, I got an email for this job that I think you should do. I've seen you tutoring, you can teach. I didn't have a teaching credential. I'd never taken a pre-teaching class. I'd never thought about teaching. I hated teaching, but it was a job and she told me how to do it. And she got me all the information I needed so that I could apply for what was called the pre-intern program. And so I was able to immediately, you know, get a job when I graduated. And it wasn't what I had expected, but it was a job with healthcare. It was a job that paid around 36,000 a year, which was not horrible. That was the best I'd ever gotten in my life, but it wasn't medicine. And I told myself, okay, this is what I had to do. We'll wait a couple of years and I'll try again. But that's not how things worked out because true to form, after my first year of being a teacher, I had my third kid. That's the little one in the bottom with the, the funny face. They're still like that. And so I ended up going down the education route instead. I said, you know, this is a stable job. Who cares about my hopes and dreams? You know, I, I have to take care of my kids. I have to keep a roof over our heads. We need money. We need food. We need rent. And so I pursued further in education. I started taking my credentialing classes at Cal State Northridge. And then I realized I could get the master's and I was so excited about it. So I took a few extra classes and I graduated with master's degree. And I thought, you know, I think I should just stay in education. How dare someone like me think that I can go after this degree? I don't deserve it. I can't be a doctor. And so I enrolled for an administrative credential program so I could be a high school principal. And one of my best friends who was a teacher at the school I was at at the time, pulled me aside and yelled at me, very lovingly. And she said, you know, you hate this. You hate teaching. You don't wanna be a principal. You wanna be a doctor. What are you doing? And she convinced me to give it a try. And she was right. I had never tried. I'd had this dream for so many years. And I told myself that I wasn't worthy because of all the things that happened when I was a teenager. And I was still blaming myself for everything that happened because that was what my family was still telling me. They were telling me all of that was my fault, completely 100% on me as a child. And so I didn't deserve the things that I wanted. But she told me I was wrong and she told me to go for it. And, and I'm still grateful to her for that because she was right. I did need to try. So I enrolled in the science classes because I told myself, you know, I can't keep teaching forever and I don't love it. And so at least I'll finish that degree that I started and I'll get my second bachelor's. And if I don't get into medical school, I'll go work in a lab somewhere because I still didn't think I would get it, even though I was willing to do everything that I was supposed to do. I was willing to do the entire application and try. So I started volunteering first with the clinical care extender program. We have that in multiple hospitals down in Southern California. And at first I was just volunteering four hours a week. And even while being a full-time high school teacher with three kids, one of whom was going to speech therapy, and I think they were in two or three activities because kids go to activities. They go to like gymnastics and basketball and soccer and all this ridiculous stuff. And I was on PTA board because that was what was needed for one of my kids to get what they needed. With all of that, they asked me if I could take a leadership role. And even though my life was busy and it was overly full, when I was in the hospital, I felt like I was home. It was right back to that same feeling that I had when I was you know, in labor with my first kid. From that very first shift I took, 
I knew that I was in the place where I was supposed to be and I was willing to do anything to get there. And it was hard. I started doing leadership and I think I put in about 2000 hours. You know, when you calculated all your hours for the medical school application, I put a lot of hours into leadership. But that program, I was working more so with, you know, like the nurses and the nurse assistants, and I really wasn't seeing what the job was. And so I heard about another program and I decided to do a second volunteer program where I was volunteering down at USC where I could shadow physicians. And at that point, I was so sure I was going to be a pediatrician. So I got rotations with pediatrics and also with um, like the burn unit, which was pretty cool. And in that time, I had an opportunity to really work with like the different specialties within pediatrics, with genetics, with pulmonary, with just regular standard pediatrics. And I loved it. It was amazing. I, I did some research just to get it on my application. I sucked at research, so that wasn't a good backup plan. And then I got to MCAT. And MCAT truly is a four letter word. It is a horrible beast for people with test anxiety. Um, I never had test anxiety until I started trying to get into medical school. I walked in to take MCAT that first time, and I threw up in the first section. So I had to avoid that test. And then I went back and tried again, and I froze, and I ran out of time on the first or second section. That happened another time. The fourth time, I took a score, and it wasn't good. At that point, my pre-med advisor came to me and she asked me what was happening. And I told her, you know, truly, I didn't have time to study. I didn't have the resources that a lot of the other students had because that's kind of what this is. You have to kind of match up to that playing field that's not really even or fair. And a lot of people take courses. And so she gifted me one of the Kaplan courses. She, and a lot of the pre-med advisors, this is something to keep in mind. A lot of them get free courses every semester or every year. And so sometimes if you're really honest with them about your struggle, they might have a course gift certificate that they're trying to figure out who to give it to. So keep that in mind if this is something that you need down the road. She gave me the gift certificate and I studied and I was so ready to take that test. And it was the end of the cycle and I was about to take it. And then my brother-in-law died. And I still walked in and took the test and I got the, almost the same score I got the previous time. I shouldn't have taken it and I knew better. But, you know, I, I was doing what I always did. I always pushed forward. And my, my thought there is that's probably not the best idea. So if you learn anything from me, you know, kind of listen to those red flags in your life that are telling you maybe this isn't the best idea and put a pause on things where you're not going to get that score you need. So needless to say, I didn't get in to any US medical schools. I applied to very, very many medical schools and MD and DO alike. I got a lot of secondaries with automatic rejections when I paid them a second time. Um, that was a huge problem that I did not like. I think that's very unfair and it needs to be dealt with. But unfortunately, a lot of programs would let you pay and then let you pay again and then tell you, no, we're not taking you or never reject you. Just never say anything about your application. So I had zero interviews. My advisor spoke to me again and she said, maybe it's time to think about Caribbean schools. At first I was hesitant, you know? So I went to the info sessions. I went to the Ross one. I went to the St. George's one. And at the Ross one, they posted on the screen when they were going over everything about their school, that they had a K through eight kids school on campus that was accessible for the professors as well as the students. And that was when like a little light bulb clicked. I could do this and I could take my kids and they would be near me. I would be able to make sure they were okay because St. George's didn't have that. They had local schools and my kids didn't speak the language. And so it wouldn't have worked for them there. But if they were at a K through eight, they could continue in English in an American school without having to disrupt their lives too much. So I figured, sure, I'll apply and see what happens. And I applied to one medical school and I got one interview. And I got one yes. And that's really what it comes down to is all you need is one person to say yes, one school to say yes. And I went. You know, I know a lot of people were very devastated, very upset that they got into a Caribbean medical school. I cried. I packed my bags. I told everybody goodbye. And I left. I was so excited to go because for me, that was my one chance. 
But, you know, backtracking when I got that one acceptance before I completely, completely packed all my bags and quit my job and moved my family to another country, I had to call a lawyer. And that's because I looked up the California medical code for doctors and I saw that there was something in there about criminal convictions. And I had to check to make sure that that thing that happened when I was 13 wasn't going to prevent me from moving forward with my life. And it was like the wind getting knocked out of me to realize that I had done everything. I did the degree, I did the research, I did the volunteering, a lot of volunteering. I took those stupid tests. I took MCAT five times, I hated that test. And it might've all been for nothing. And I was so lucky because, you know, since my difficulties were adjudicated as a minor, I was able to move forward. But I know people who just for a matter of a few years, if they have a criminal offense at 18 or 19, might not be eligible for any kind of medical license, even after going to med school and even after everything else, they might not be able to practice. Because we don't really forgive people when they when they break laws in our country and they do their time and then we hold it against them still for the rest of their lives. So that's definitely an advocacy point for us to think about in the future. You know, if, if we're really forgiving people and having them do their time, then it should not stick to them forever. So fortunately, I was able to move forward. And here you see pictures where I'm in the marketplace. Um, they let us go and take blood pressures for people at market on Saturdays. And so here I am being very, very excited that I'm a medical student. Um, but again, we're poor. So there's my son collecting guavas from the trees so they could have guava juice at home. And we went down once to the capital city to get pizza. And so you see my youngest kid is very happy to have pizza. That was a very big trip because we couldn't afford it often, but we tried to do it like once a semester. You know, it was hard. I'm, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Medical school was really, really, really hard. At that point in my life, it was the hardest thing I had ever done. Harder than raising kids, harder than, you know, being homeless, harder than prison, harder than dealing with my family. It was really hard. If you ask me that now, I would say other things have been harder, like the pandemic and taking care of patients during that and losing people. And then the loss of one of my brothers really took me you know, through the ringer and back. And so there are different levels of hard throughout different points in your life. But at that moment, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done. Somehow I was supposed to learn all of the medical school curriculum while raising three kids. You know, in my mind, I thought, wow, I work really hard. I have a full-time job. I'm volunteering at two hospitals. I'm doing all these other things, PTA board activities with my kids, like medical school is gonna be so much easier. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, so it was a lot of work and I studied a lot, um, but also I had a support network. There was something beautiful about being stuck in a tiny island with a bunch of my classmates and their families because we created our own like support network. Um, the families kind of bonded together, the students um, who had children kind of bonded together. And so we had this little community that we were able to develop. And my kids really love the island. So if you find yourself in a situation where like Caribbean is the only way and you really, really want it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Just know that nothing is ever easy. It's going to be hard at the same step, same, same board exam, same residency application process. There's different levels of hard, but I got to the end and I got what I wanted out of it. So it kind of worked out. Um, there's a lot of really cool pictures from the island there. Um, if you look at the top right, that's where the kids were playing dodgeball. We did a lot of like little medical clubs and there was a dodgeball fundraiser every semester. So we just had the kids play dodgeball and beat each other up for money. It was great. But then residency happened and I needed to find a job because you know that there's not enough residency positions. There's about 5,000 people every year who don't match. And being a foreign grad, I was terrified. What if I didn't get a job? I had these three kids who kept telling me they needed me to have a job. They were very persistent in making sure that they had money for food and clothing and friendship and different things that they were doing in their lives. I applied to 150 programs. People who go to US medical schools tend to apply to about 30, maybe 40 maximum. Foreign grads during my cycle applied to at least 100, but I had a low board score because test anxiety. 
And I also was very desperate to get a job. And so I applied to more than a lot of my peers. I applied to 150 programs and I got 13 interviews. Four of the interviews that I got requests for were in California. And California is one of the hardest places to get into medical school and residency, unless, you know, everything lines up. Because California schools, you know, there's so many of us that want to go to medical school. And everywhere else, they know we're coming back to California. Why wouldn't we? All of us want to be here. And so there's this huge competition for a job. I didn't know where I would end up, and I was willing to go anywhere. So I accepted all 13 of those interviews, except for one. Um, one of them was in Puerto Rico, and my kids said if I took them to another island, they would run away. And so at that point, I said, okay, I don't want to have to search the world for my kids. That would be a really hard time to do it. And so I accepted 12 interviews. I ended up going to 11 because on one of them, I was taking a plane and we had an engine blow midair and we landed in a random snowfield in Ohio and I missed an interview and they never rescheduled. So I ended up just having 11. One of the interviews was a disaster. So I ranked 10 programs. I easily could have not matched anywhere, easily. But something shifted in me while I was in medical school. I realized that I had gone through significant traumas and my experiences that I was having with patients were so vastly different from the experiences my peers were having. And I wrote a very honest personal statement about my background, about you know being homeless and how that impacted how I talk to patients and how I related with people. And I had beautiful interviews because of it. And I had one bad interview where they kind of made fun of me the whole time. So that's the one that I didn't rank. They were a horrible program and they shouldn't have done what they did. They wasted my time and it was insulting. But at the end of the day, with those 10 programs that I ranked, the top four I put on my rank list were in California. And I matched back home, even with a low step score even in a Caribbean school, even with every other odd against me, I came home and I got to work at Riverside County Hospital for my three years of training. And it was a hard program. And I was fortunate to get to go there. You know, it turned out they only interviewed and ranked students who spoke at least an extra language. And I'm fluent in Spanish because I had to learn because my husband's from Guatemala and his family doesn't all speak English. So I had learned over the years. It made a huge difference in giving me that opportunity because they needed doctors who could speak Spanish. So I got my opportunity. My kids just keep getting bigger and bigger in these pictures. They're so big. And it was hard. But hard and impossible are two different things. So we need to talk about the pearls, you know, money and loans. When I went to medical school, I didn't realize that it was going to be so expensive. There are so many hidden costs in medical education from, you know, test prep booklets, test prep questions, exam costs, you know, traveling for interviews, paying for applications to residency. We have to pay to get a job. And so there are all these places along the way that cost more than you expect. And all of the students got the same financial aid cut that I got, but I had to make mine last for five people and theirs was for one. And so somehow I was supposed to feed my kids and pay rent often in two places if I had to do an away rotation and make that work. It, it was quite a struggle. So especially if you're taking a family with you wherever you're going, try to set aside a little bit of money and learn to live frugally before you go. Because you don't want to be like me, where I was taking side jobs. I was working at the mall for a while as a third year medical student. And in order to pull that off, I had to sign up as the chief medical student so I could control the schedule to make sure I could set up those hours that I could work at a little children's boutique at the mall. You know, it wasn't a good setup. It was exhausting. And so if you're able to set up some way, either through getting extra scholarships or setting some money aside before you go, it will make a huge difference down the road. As far as loans, I, I didn't understand what I was signing up for. And if you're on Twitter or anywhere where doctors are vocal about how much we owe, it's all true. You know, when I signed up, 
I remember looking at the packet and my school said that they were going to cost 15,000 a quarter and, or a semester. And it was a 10 semester program. So I was like, okay, 15,000. That's 150,000 to go to medical school. Not bad. And a little bit of money for cost of living. I didn't ask how much. I figured it would be about 5,000 because I didn't think it would cost that much to live down in the Caribbean. I was wrong. At the school, at the time that I went to Ross, they were still in Dominica. And unfortunately, the landlords had figured out how much our student loan amount was. And so all of the rents were US rent prices and all of the other items were increased in cost as well because they knew we could pay it. And so it was prohibitively expensive. So that's 15 plus 10 for a semester. So $25,000 in loan money. But I started in spring and I didn't know when I started that the next semester in September, every September they raised the cost of tuition. And so what was 15,000 became 17,000, became 20,000, became 22,000 a semester with that still 10,000 being added on. And so by the time I finished, I owed probably around 350 or 360, somewhere around there just from medical school, but I had undergrad loans. And so I was already at about 400. And when I was in medical school, you know, they used to have this thing when you're in residency where your loans were on hold because you're barely, you know, getting by and you're working 80 hours a week. So you can't tangibly get a second job to pay off your loans. But they took away that, you know, special situation while I was in training so that when I hit residency, interest started accruing immediately. So by the time I finished residency, I owed over $500,000. So it is more expensive to go to a Caribbean school because most of them jack up the prices. A lot of the DO schools do the same. So it's very important to look at those numbers and decide, is this a debt that I'm willing to take on because I might have to pay all of that back plus prohibitively high interest? There are options. You can get into one of the loan repayment options where it's like 10 years of work and you're paying a percentage of your income and then eventually your debt gets wiped away. Um, those options aren't always the best because it dictates where you work. It has to be at one of those places that has loan repayment. And so there's a lot of calculations you have to make to decide what kind of job you want to do and how you're gonna pay back that loan when you're done. So it's something to think about. Be very honest with yourself about money because I do know students who got in who really wanted to be a doctor in the beginning and changed their mind by the midpoint but kept going because they owed the loans. Because in their mind, there was no way they would pay back that half of medical school loan, so they just went and got the whole thing, even though they didn't want it anymore. And so it's really important to think about how much money you're borrowing, because it could influence your decision. Especially for those of us going to community college, a lot of us don't have that extra money in our family where we can ask somebody to help us out. It's not like a lot of the classmates. What I didn't understand until I got to medical school was that a lot, a lot of students come from families of doctors. They come from families where they're expected to be a doctor from the moment that they're born, and their family will do anything to get them there. And I had classmates who paid cash for their tuition. That was not something that I could have ever thought of doing, but it kind of speaks towards, you know, why the rest of us need to get there because that's where you know, we can help the most patients because we understand what, what it's like, what the real world is and, and having to make hard decisions. And so it's incredibly important to keep in mind that even if it's hard, we belong there. We absolutely belong there. There's a lot of gatekeeping. A lot of that happens just at the application level, but also with mentorship and everything else, sometimes you can bypass it. I had a student that I was mentoring years ago, maybe about seven or eight years ago. And he was volunteering with me. I was going down to Mexico every month on a clinic um, trip. And he had some bad grades in his application. And he did better after the first year of school. And he had a reason why he had struggled. So we wrote a really good explanation for it. I helped him with his essay. And I wrote a stellar letter of recommendation because he deserved it. And he applied to his university. It was one of the UCs and they turned him down. 
that didn't look at his file. And I kept telling him, you need to go talk to them. And he showed up at their office one day and he said, can you please at least look at my file? And they read the letter that I wrote for him and he got in. And he's a doctor and he's in residency right now. Because sometimes it's not just the test scores. Sometimes it's, you know, I want that person as my colleague, let them in. And so once you get through, your voice matters and you can make change for other people where it didn't exist for us. And for you now, you've got, you know, peers who might have these connections and they can help you find a good doctor to mentor you and to help you along the way. So you have those letters too. I didn't have any doctors that I knew on a personal level for my application when I applied to medical school. And I had classmates who had their uncles with different last names write the letters for them. That's not fair, but you can't change that part of the system. You can change making sure you get mentorship. So work with each other and make sure that just as strong as their networks are, ours are stronger. We need to make sure that we have opportunities and access which means if you find something that's good and you find someone good in your community who mentors students, share that name. Make sure other people get to them too. Something else I didn't understand was that math science GPA. You know, that was what prevented me from getting into the UCs, I mean, not the UCs, I'm sorry, the US medical schools. That third year I had when I transferred into UCLA and I was on academic probation, there was nothing I could do to change the calculation for my GPA for that year because I got really low scores in my science classes. And looking back, I jumped into the two high math classes that I shouldn't have been taking without really going back and relearning the skills that I needed. You know, when I became homeless as a teenager, I was a junior in high school and I had taken pre-calculus and gotten a B. And the B was only because I promised my instructor I wasn't going to take any more classes at the high school in math because I was really struggling and it was starting to show through. I had a great GPA, I was working, you know, I was trying to do everything right and it all fell apart. But the first indicators that things weren't going well were those grades. I didn't have a solid math foundation. I finished high school while I was homeless. I was doing independent studies, so my butt was not in a chair. I was doing packet work and turning it in. And that's great because I deserved a diploma, but I wasn't in a class learning math. And I got to community college and it wasn't something that I took right away. It was at the end of my first year or beginning of my second year when I said, oh, wait, I need to take math. And I jumped right into a calculus class. Five years after my last math class, it was the wrong move. I dropped the class after I got a 10 on my first test. And then I went back and I took pre-calculus and it was still the wrong class. You need to be very careful that you're not taking classes that are too hard. It's okay to take the full sequence. It is okay to slow down because what it comes down to is if you go fast and you jump ahead and you take those harder classes, you're going to end up with that GPA that is really you know, hard to overcome. But if you slow down and take an extra class earlier on and build that foundation and make sure you really understand like math or science at the lower level so you can move forward, you'll have that high GPA and you'll have that high level of understanding. So it's like a win-win. And I wish somebody had told me that because I would have just slowed down and gone back and retaken those math classes that I had forgotten from high school. So definitely something to consider. And when you're talking to new community college students at the very beginning of their years, mention that to them because they look at all four of your undergrad years when they're calculating your math science GPA. They'll recalculate a secondary one for post-bachelor years, but it's not the same because a lot of the computers filter for that GPA. And so if you want the interviews, you've got to take some easy classes in there to cushion it. Other things, if you're going to med school with kids, with a family, a spouse, I saw a lot of divorces in medical school and the bad interview I had for residency, when I asked the residents if they were happy, they said three of the residents were in the process of divorce. Everything about that program was wrong for me and I did not rank them. But as far as medical school, I saw a lot of people who, you know, they weren't both all in or one person was too consumed with studying to 
remember the focus that was needed to maintain a relationship. The people who went with kids, if they didn't have a partner who was on board 100% for them to study medicine, they struggled. Either their grades struggled, they failed out, or their marriage failed. So whatever it is, if you've got children, you need a support system. It can be your mom, it can be a sister, it can be a best friend. They might have to go with you. But it's really important to maintain that family unit. If your goal is to not get a divorce, then make sure that, you know, you're still putting some time into that relationship. It's a hard four years, but you can't ignore your spouse for four years. I saw people trying to do that and it doesn't work. Um, 10% of medical students graduate from medical school with at least one kid. I started medical school with three kids. It was really, really hard. But at the same time, my peers who later on had their first kid in third or fourth year, they struggled too. Because having kids is a struggle whenever you have them. We're never going to be ready. And so it's really important to think about that, especially if, if you're female and you're thinking about moving forward with babies at some point in your life. I have a lot of friends now who delayed having a kid, who decided, you know, I'm going to do the pre-med. I'm going to go to undergrad. I'm going to go maybe some grad school, maybe straight into med school. I'll go to residency, fellowship, maybe a second fellowship, get my job, my career established, buy a house, get married, and then have kids. And unfortunately, if you wait that whole process until you're like 35, 36, 37 to start thinking about having a child, you could face infertility. And so my recommendation is if you want to have a kid, you have a kid. If you don't want to, you don't. It's your timeline. There's never a good time. There's never a bad time. You know, it's okay during med school. It's okay during residency. The right program will support you. Wherever you are, they should support you. There are laws to protect during pregnancy and after. And if they don't support you, it's not the right place. And so don't stop the decision to have children just based on how hard things are, because it will always be hard. Um, there are a lot of like Facebook groups for support for female physicians, especially if you have kids. And I was added into a bunch of these during residency and they have been mind blowingly helpful. And I've made real, real friends through those groups where, you know, I get to know other doctors who are going through the same thing. And I know I'm gearing this a lot towards people who have like female reproductive organs because it's super important to know, you know, when you're going to have those kids. Um, other options would be, you know, retrieving eggs or embryos and setting them aside for later. And so that's something to think about if you really are going to delay, make sure you take that into account because that's something a lot of the older physicians are saying they wish somebody had mentioned to them. So it's just something to add to your list. Think about when. And if you don't want to have kids at all, that's great. You don't have to think about when. You just do what you're doing because it's great. But if you're thinking about having them, you need to kind of figure out when because it does have implications. As far as mentorship, you need a mentor. By the time I got to medical school, I knew I needed a mentor. I knew that I was at risk of failing out. I knew I had a low MCAT and I had low grades from some of those years in school. And so I latched on to a mentor and she kept trying to like shush me away. And I still stuck by her while I was on the island and I kept showing up for mentorship. And she's like, I don't know why you keep coming here. You pass everything. And I said, well, that's why I keep coming here because I want to pass everything because she mostly worked with students who were struggling or had to repeat a semester. And I just didn't want that to be me. So I never repeated. I passed all my tests straight through. And when I did that, I was the first mom who did. Usually the moms in the program had failed at least a semester, if not failed out. And so as I saw how to do that, I created a group for student parents. And because, you know, when you create something, you can name it whatever you want. I called it Madam Moms and Dads at Medical School. And so <laughs> we had fun with it. And I made sure that, you know, I passed on what I had learned to my peers. And the girl who came right after me passed everything, too but with higher grades and ended up doing very well. And we just kept passing that along to make sure we were helping our peers. So you can get mentorship and be a mentor. 
it's so important down the road if you think 10 years in the future. If you think about all the gates you've had to try to climb through, you have to kind of break down those gates for the next generation in a way that makes it possible to get them to where we are. It doesn't have to be hard for them just because it was hard for us. You're going to hear a lot of people who say the exact opposite as you go through medical school. The people who are like, well, I had to work 80, 90, 100, 200 hours a week. 200 is even possible, but they'll say it. You know, so they should too. That's not true. We have to make it safe. We have to make it fair. And we have to do what's best for patients all at the same time. And so it's okay to change a system that's not working. It's not working. There's massive burnout. People are struggling. It's okay to change a system that's not working to make it better for the generations after us. My next pearl, medical Spanish. You do not have time in medical school to learn Spanish. You can learn a couple of words, but you're not going to have time to learn a language. So if you still have time before you apply and you plan to stay in California and you don't already speak Spanish, it's time to learn. You want to at least be able to ask, you know, basic questions, you know, but more so you want to understand so you can have conversations. Some of my best patient interactions have been in Spanish. And I'm honored that I was able to learn, still kind of frustrated about how hard it was to learn. You know, it was hard but I'm glad I learned it before medical school. And so that's one of the things to think about because it'll give you opportunities. Like if you think back to the residency that I got, everyone who interviewed and got accepted had to speak a second language to be accepted. They wouldn't have even taken me if I didn't speak another language. And then ACEs. So my other pearl, this is something I didn't learn about until I was at the end of medical school and early residency. So I didn't know how much trauma I was carrying with me. I thought I had mostly healed from that thing that had happened when I was a teenager, but I hadn't. So ACEs, this is kind of like a buzzword in medicine. These are adverse childhood experiences. There's a list of 10 basic questions. There are others for different degrees of this, but the main test questions are these 10 that are in front of you. And they are questions that ask about, you know, the home situation, is somebody abused? Was there alcohol or drugs? Was there, you know, sexual violence? Did you feel neglected? Was someone in prison? Was there divorce? And you're queuing up like how many yeses and how many noes you have. And, you know, a very important study, a landmark study actually in the late 1990s found that anybody with at least four of these, where they have at least a score of four, then they're at a very high risk of adult medical conditions. Um, because they had these things happen as a kid, it changed the way that their body is wired so that they have a higher likelihood of chronic illness, like COPD, cancer, liver disease, cirrhosis. You know, they have a higher risk behavior, um, usage of alcohol, usage of drugs, mental illness, depression, PTSD, anxiety, things like that, and premature death. That was what made me so mad about this study when I read it the first time, is that that stuff that didn't kill me when I was a kid could still kill me now. And I wanted to learn how to make sure that I was able to take care of myself in a way that I could reverse all of this risk. And so I started reading on it and studying about it because there are ways to build up more resilience and, and make sure that you don't get sick like this is predicting. Um, what I would like to say is if you find that you have a high ACE score when you're looking at this, if you're counting this up and you see that you've got at least a four, or if you have a number that points towards, you know, stuff has happened that's unresolved, it is in your best interest to go ahead and start trying to heal from these things now instead of waiting until, you know, all of a sudden you're sleeping four hours a night, you're under high stress, you're worried about exams. Now you're taking care of patients. Now you're moving around a lot on rotations. Some of the doctors are being mean. A lot of doctors are mean. You know, if you're going through all of that stress and you haven't dealt with earlier trauma, it can be really hard and it can be dangerous. We have a lot of physician suicides, about one a day. I don't want to lose anyone else. And so it's really important to think about, you know, healing yourself so you can be the best healer for your future patients. So if you have a high number here, it's time. It's time to talk to someone, find a mentor, a therapist, read some books on it, read more about it, 
Um, definitely watch the TED Talk by Nadine Burke Harris. I watch it at least once a year. It's life changing. And it is something that you should definitely look up and add to your list of things to do. And then there's a website, Ace is Too High. So that's my main point that I really want to drive home is make sure you're in a place of healing so that you can be a healer. And, you know, I'm just honored to be able to share that with all of you, because looking back at 15, 16, 17 year old me, I was just trying to survive. And now, because the right people pushed me at the right moments, I get to do so much more than that. And I get to work with people who were like me and try to help them survive and thrive too. And so, you know, all of us have a different reason for coming to where we are, for wanting to become physicians. But my reason for becoming a physician didn't become clear to me until I was already in it. And patients started to tell me, you know, I know you understand. I know you care. I'm so glad you're here. And I had very different interactions with patients because they can tell if you're there for them. And so I hope that all of us get to have those experiences too. Okay. And then time for Q&A, my favorite part. Um, contact information, my email address is pretty easy to find me on um, Twitter. I refuse to call it the other name, Instagram, Blue Sky or TikTok. And I'm ready for Q&A. Ah, sorry. I'm going to do the stop share so you guys yeah. can ask questions. Hi, yeah. yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I'll be uh, kind of swapping. Uh, we're doing Q and A. Um, so we do have one question and then another comment uh, on, in the Q and A. I'll go ahead and um, pretty much go with the first question. So the first question um, pretty much says, uh, "Please help me with some homeless criminal arrest resources." I'm struggling as a single mom. I have also been arrested twice recently, once my ex-husband and, and another with my eldest kid doing indecent things on social media. Uh, my court case all ended as exonerated and dismissed, but finding a job today is really hard for me due to the background check. I was once excited for my future, but not so much anymore. Is, is there still any hope left for me because I really do want to continue on with my career path in the health field because it is all I know and have passion for? Yeah, it's that sounds so hard. Um, if you've been exonerated, then they should not be using it against you. And so you definitely do need to see someone for legal advice. Um, I know down in Los Angeles area, they have public counsel and they're like a free legal team. And I'm sure that they have something free in whatever county that you're coming from. But you're looking for any kind of free legal advice, look for it on the county level. And usually it's through a law school. Um, usually the law schools, they'll have like interns who go out and they do about a year of community service. Um, that's where we got all of our free legal care whenever I was in the homeless youth shelters and in the drop-in programs back when I was a teenager and they still consistently go out and help the young people. So I know that those systems exist because someone needs to help you with that. You have every right to chase your dreams. Yes, and that's good too. And I just wanted to follow up. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Sinos. Um, the second um, individual is saying, thank you so much for sharing all of this. My story is not the same as yours in a lot of ways, but I'm curious how you know when sharing your journey is okay. And the reason I want to go into pa pediatrics is because of my childhood, but it is also linked to my mental health story. So I avoid sharing a lot and do not know that if it's the right choice. So I'm assuming the question is, um, like, when is it a good idea to really be kind of personal and kind of um, share about your story? So I, I have actually a really firm answer on this because I've seen students struggle. I didn't disclose when I went to medical school about my history of homelessness. And a couple of years after me, another student did disclose. And the media attention with early medical school was too hard and she ended up dropping out. I had a pre-med advisor who told me very clearly point blank, do not mention your mother's mental illness because if they take you, then it's a liability if you end up having it too because it can potentially pass genetically and people are people. And if they have that on the record, they can't take you. 
And so my answer kind of sucks, but like things like that, I wouldn't necessarily include in an application for medical school. Um, for residency, it's different. You know, once you're done with medical school, you've proven that you got through the same steps as everyone else, the same board exams, the same rotations, you met the requirements. And so I felt safer at the point where I was applying for residency to speak to my experiences, but still I didn't go all in. I, I told like a very surface level story of what I had overcome and why it related to what I was doing. Because for me, I was showing how I have empathy and can you know, develop rapport with patients easily, but I didn't tell them the whole thing. The soonest that I felt like I could tell my whole story was when I finished residency and I was a full attending. I didn't share my entire story until then, because even in residency, you know, there are risks involved. If you're, you know, oversharing, you could have attendings that don't agree. And I had some difficult attendings when I was in training. It wasn't, you know, the best place for me with my trauma history to train, but it was a great program overall. And for me, it was hard because there were some very triggering moments while I was being trained. And so there's different stages of when you can share. I would say don't share about things like mental illness necessarily at the level of applying for medical school. I still wouldn't necessarily share it later on. And unfortunately, medicine is in a very tough spot. Um, they don't allow in a lot of states on a lot of licenses for self-disclosure of mental illness without checks and balances. And so a lot of, you know, I know you're putting this on YouTube and I do apologize, but this is my personal opinion. A lot of people who um, who disclose about mental illness then are under like physician watchman type programs where they have to go for extra counseling. And this is why a lot of people don't go and get help necessarily because it can be punitive when it should have been protective. And so they make sometimes decisions about your future based on what you've disclosed. When rea reality, you know, in reality, if you are fully functioning and you're doing fine and you're meeting all of your requirements, it shouldn't matter, right? That's what we're telling our patients. You know, you're fully functioning so you can have your job. But for doctors, it's it's treated differently. And so there are certain things that it, it's very important that you sit down and discuss with like your mentor. Should I disclose this? Do I need to disclose this? And when I was in training, I was very limited with what I disclosed because I knew that there were risks. Once I became an attending, I kind of said, you know what, it's time. Um, mostly because I had moved back to Los Angeles and I saw that the homeless population had exploded and people in the ER sometimes were talking about patients in a very negative way. And I said, you know what, it's time. I have a lot to say. But it's, it's very hard. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where they tell you no for the future that you worked so hard for. Sorry. And we also had some other comments um, from, there's this uh, another attendee who um, wanted to thank you for sharing your story with us. And she says that she has some experience with the same things as you and is also mother of three. And so she just got accepted to a nursing school. And so she really needed to hear your story today. So she's really appreciative of that. You're gonna be great. Um, one question um, that we have um, that was uh, direct messaged me uh, directly messaged to me is how difficult was your first year as a resident with a family? It was hard, and in some places it was harder than it needed to be. Um, I had some residents who were seniors who liked to say things like, "Don't you want to go home to your kids?" And I felt like it was a challenge where. If I left early at that point, even if I was on my way walking to my car, if I left, they would say I was leaving early to go take care of my kids. So every time that someone said, are you just going to go take care of your kids? I found something else to do in the hospital and stayed in the, another hour. And I felt like that wasn't really fair, but they kept calling me out because I had kids. Like in lecture, I would have an attendee and ask a question like, oh, we're going over hand washing, you know, kids, they should wash their hands. Cheryl, how often do your kids wash your hands? And I'm like, I don't know. I never see them. And so my answer was general across the board. Like, I don't know what kids, there's no kids. And so it was really harder than it needed to be because my kids struggled. Um, 
I spend every moment that I have when I'm off, um, when I'm not sleeping, hanging out with my kids. And so even when I was an intern, two of my kids were in basketball and I went to a lot of their games. I still made sure I made time for, you know, coffee with the principal when I was available. Um, I, I showed up to anything that fit my calendar. And so I, I did some really good tetrasing of my schedule so that I could still show up for them. But I really wasn't showing up for me because you can't have all things. And so like I wasn't getting the rest that I needed because I was trying to be super mom and super intern. And so that's probably not the best way to do things. If I were to do it all over again, I would have made my husband do a little bit more. Yeah, so we have another question. So um, the question is, uh, you mentioned that one of your strengths is patient communication. What other doctors in training doing are, uh, what other doctors in training, what are they doing wrong from your point of view? I don't think that it's a matter of necessarily doing something wrong, but more just being open-minded. I didn't really understand why patients were relating to me the way that they were. And there were a couple of clues along the way that kind of pointed to what they were seeing because it wasn't like I wore a sign on my head that said, I was homeless, come talk to me. But patients knew. And I kind of started to piece it together when I had a pediatrics attending kind of call me out on my childhood. I had started like my peds rotation. It was my very first day as a medical student. And at that point, I'm um, probably early fourth year. And after two hours of following him into rooms and talking to patients, he pulled me back in the office and he said, Cheryl, you grew up rough. And I had had so many weird encounters with patients where they had told me things they'd told nobody else. So I asked him point blank, I'm like, how do you know? And he said, and I'll never forget it because it was very eye-opening. He said, you don't react. You know, that, that kid in there said that he uses drugs. Every other student that has come in the room when I have that same scenario, they freak out. They're like, oh my God, you can't use drugs. That's bad. Drugs are bad. And you're like, okay, what's your plan? How many credits do you have in high school? What are you planning to do after you graduate? And he was right. I don't react. I don't condemn people for the choices they make. I ask them what their plan is. And so it's not necessarily that they're doing something wrong, but they're not seeing the world the way that the patients see it. And so there's a disconnect. And so Really, it's kind of stepping back from that authoritarian type of relationship and really just asking people what they want and trying to meet those goals with them because they might never want what we want, but that's okay too. We let people make bad decisions and we still provide them with care. Here's another question. Um, I appreciate that you spend the time today to tell your story. If I may ask, how has medical school changed and what has stayed the same since you applied? Um, I know within my own medical school that it's no longer in Dominica and it's in Barbados because we had that hurricane that blasted the island a few years ago. And so I know their experience changed. While I was in school, the students underneath me were in a new curriculum where everything was set up differently. Like for us, it was, you know, classes were like histology and anatomy, but they learned, you know, everything about each organ as they went through, like everything for the heart, the medicines you would use, the anatomy of the heart, the histology of the heart, and then they would move on. So it was kind of embracing this whole new philosophy of like how to study and how to learn the body. And I felt like they had a very more connected um, understanding of everything. And for me, it was kind of piecemeal the way we had been taught. And so I think that's a better approach. Within different medical schools, it's hard for me to know like what's completely changed. I know it's gotten more expensive. Um, they got rid of step two CS, thankfully, the step two clinical skills. That one was just a waste of money. It was like $1,300, $1,400 to go and spend a whole day with standardized patients and do 12 patient encounters with like a 95 to 96% pass rate. And so if everyone passes, what are we measuring besides how quickly someone can pay the money to go to this test? Um, so we got rid of that and then we got step one removed from like a numerical score to a pass fail. And so those are big things that have changed other things within the residency application the past few years, because of the pandemic, it's been mostly residency interviews on zoom, which is good and bad because if the interviews are on zoom, you don't have to pay as much to go. 
but that means it's a low bar for participation. And some people have been grabbing all of the interviews and you know, maybe interviewing at like 20, 30 places. And so it kind of makes it hard for other people to get those interviews too. And so some people end up with only maybe like three or four interviews for the whole cycle. And so it, it's kind of problematic. And I think they're still trying to figure out a way to make that work because there was a huge discrepancy in the number of people who they wanted to have matched this year versus you know, who, what, like what positions were still available when they had that first match list come out in March. And so that's something they're still working on, but program by program, I'm not sure at each individual school. I just posted a, a previous talk. We had six single moms that were in community, they were single mothers when they were in community college, med school and residency. Good. And they all have their different antidotes of how they did it. So watch it if you're interested. That's cool. I like a kind of like a personal question or like my own question. Um, I am planning to stay in California as like a medical provider. And you mentioned that medical Spanish is really helpful. Um, are there any websites or apps that you'd recommend to learn medical Spanish? I recommend regular classes, like learn Spanish first and the medical Spanish is easy. Like once I spoke Spanish, it was a matter of learning like 20 words I didn't already know. You know, because it, it really comes down to being able to have a conversation. And I've had so many patients where I've walked in the room and people don't talk to them. They don't use interpreters. They don't ask questions. Sometimes they say, you know, like, oh, the patient is just confused, but really they just need someone who speaks Spanish to talk to them. And I'll get a completely different story when I see them. And so I honestly feel like it's something that if you're in California, you should know it. Yeah, I, I personally recommend doing a study abroad program in the Spanish speaking country. Um, that's the best way to learn a language. You have to be forced to speak it. Um, but also, if you're in California, um, you don't have far to go and practice. I mean, you go to any fast food place. I work in a hospital and I practice my Spanish with all the housekeeping staff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you don't really need to go far to speak Spanish or practice Spanish. Um, and there are places that, you know, that's the only language they speak. So most fast food place workers, if you go into uh, their Spanish is much better than English. So you don't have to go far. But I think I think studying abroad is I think is the best place to, to do it. And then, you know, because I think, you know, I mean, English is my fourth, la fourth language and I learned it when I was 12, when I came here and nobody else spoke French. So that's how I learned English. So for any other language, um, and if you're able to, and the nice thing about studying abroad is that most universities match our financial need. And it's also much cheaper to get housing in in a developing country uh, where you could probably get like a, a homestay for like 200 bucks a month versus an apartment in Los Angeles for $2,000. So um, so yeah, so study abroad, like uh, put that into your um, schedule and, uh, and do that. I think that's one of the best ways to learn a language. And if that's not possible, the way that I started learning, this is gonna sound really bad. So the way that I started learning when I was a teenager is I got like Shakira CDs and I started translating them out word by word because she was my favorite singer, I did that. And then I was watching novelas. Um, my recommendation is not the Colombian ones because the Spanish is very different. Um, definitely they're great to watch, but like do usually like the Mexican ones. Um, watch novelas. Trust me, you're going to learn because there's some great storylines and you're going to keep coming back for more. Netflix has a lot of them. And like children's books. And so if you get like little kids books that are in Spanish or like Disney movies and you watch the movie, you already know all the words to in English and you watch it in Spanish a bunch of times, you're going to start picking up vocabulary. And you do that all in conjunction with a class or in my case, a mother-in-law who was so mean to me and I needed to learn the language, then you'll be fine. The way I learned English was I watched Baywatch and Knight Rider in France. And it was the, like the two popular shows. And when I came here on the reruns, I remember watching like each, some of the episodes like two, three times in French. So I knew what they were talking about and I would watch it in English because it was dubbed in French. It wasn't in English, it was dubbed in French. And so when I came here, 
a couple of mo- like Star Wars movies too. I think that was a couple mm-hmm. that I watched in English. So um, yeah, and that that's also really good because you know, like you could pick up a lot of things um, to do that. So that's that's one way I did it. But that's how I learned English was a night writer. They watch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we have one more or uh, several more questions. Um, sorry, excuse me, my dogs are in the background. <laughs> um, let me see here. Can I join uh, you in the workforce after all my mess is taken care of? Because I would love to get into the workforce and help make a change in, in homelessness and system impacted too. Um, I'm in a weird place in my medical career where I don't really have a stable permanent employment. Um, The pandemic kind of broke me. Um, A lot of my patients died from COVID and I admitted a lot of my coworkers and their family members and community members. And I kind of wanted to detach myself from that close relationship with the hospital. I was at that place almost five years. And so I'm doing like temporary assignments. And so if my work situation changes, yes, but I don't know what my work situation is going to look like over the next couple of years. I'm trying to just do about one to two weeks a month um, of work. And I just do like 10 or 11 nights straight because I'm working nights and then I go home. And so I'm in a weird situation right now. Maybe. Maybe. Um, here's another question. Um, how much is a low MCAT score and GPA that will make you less likely to get into medical school? All right, I guess the to rephrase it um, a little bit is how much like getting lower scores will affect you in to getting into medical school? Um, I know within the US system, I didn't have a high enough score and I hit right above the national average. I don't know this new system you guys have because the MCAT did change too. So I don't know the scale as well, but you need to be above average and usually at least one significant, like one standard deviation above it. If you're not, you know, Caribbean is valid and there are other schools that are also valid. It's hard. And so you want to make sure you research that pathway um, or you retake it. But there are a lot of schools that do filter out based on the MCAT score, even though we know that that's not a determinant of how good a physician someone will become. That needs to change too. Yeah, so we have another question. Um, how, do you, how do you describe your motivations to pursue a career in medicine and advocacy while only briefly touching upon your life experiences dur- during early pre-med interviews and your personal statement. How do you carefully highlight your resilience, clinical competency, and compassion, especially when poverty, poverty, homelessness, and witnessing mental health is such a stigma? You know, when I think about the interviews that I had that were the most meaningful and the ones that got me to where I am now, um, my medical school interview, there, there was like a funny moment where the lady asked me, you know, I see you had classes for these three years, took one semester off, and then these three, four or five years straight, why did you take that one semester off? Which made no sense, right? Like, why would you nitpick about one semester that I didn't go? And and so I, I kind of joked and told the truth. I told the story of what happened. You know, I was like, well, I went to class and I came home and turns out my kid cut off all my kid's hair and my husband was struggling and my kid had no hair. And so now I needed to give them some mom time and I took a semester off and she loved that answer because I didn't lie and and it didn't matter what the answer was but I told her the truth and I told her you know there are some other priorities that I have in my life and I decided to shift my focus and so sometimes it's just a matter of being very honest and saying hey there was this point in my life where I needed to step back and reevaluate um and I don't know if that's applicable if there's like you know semesters you've taken off where you could answer something like that but that was like a key moment. And then because of what I had on my personal statement, I had one interview in Tennessee for residency. And this was the program I thought I was going to match at. I didn't think I was gonna end up in California because I mean, who would have thought with my scores or anything, I was going to get what I wanted. Um, But this program was pretty cool. And the person who was supposed to interview me had stepped out for an emergency with a patient. And they gave me someone who really hadn't had time to review my, my personal statement or anything in advance. And he walked me over to his office and he was just trying to waste time until it was time for the other person to meet with me. And he glanced at my personal statement 
and he saw I had mentioned my kids. And he asked me the single most best question I've ever had. And he could only ask it because I'd mentioned my kids. So it was fair game. He said, tell me what you like about your kids. And I just smiled and told him everything I like about my kids because I actually like my kids. And I think that was a really smart question because he was able to see right away that like, I'm a good person and my kids are cool and I have a good relationship with them. And so they really liked me because we had that connection right there. And then at the place where I ended up matching at, I don't remember what it was, but there was a question that was asked by my interviewer and there was another doctor in the same room. And I answered with something that made them laugh. And I don't remember what it was, but they found it funny. And he was the one that voted for me to get the residency. And he told me because he became my mentor. And so part of it is just relaxing, calm down. Like at the point that you're at an interview, that's because you met the cutoff. You met the requirement. They can take you. Now they want to know, can they put up with you for three years? Do they want to have coffee with you? Are they going to enjoy spending 80 hours a week with you? And so they're interviewing you, but also you're interviewing them. Because remember, there was a program I didn't rank and they were jerks, but they probably would have taken me. You want the place that fits you. You don't want to be somewhere for three years where you'll be miserable or where you're going to divorce somebody. And I know that we're told our whole way through, you know, this is an opportunity and we're fighting for that opportunity. But it's their opportunity to have us, too. And so if you kind of like flip the script and think about that, like, why should you go there? Why do you think that this would be the right program for you? Have they shown it to you? And ask those questions that kind of tease that out, because it's really hard to figure out in a very short interview if they're the place for you. It's easy to figure out if they're not the place for you. But, you know, have some hope. Once you're at that interview level, you're already a possible. Like, they can take you. Um, a question that I had was, um, how, you mentioned earlier that um, you're like a travel physician and you're currently residing in Fresno. How does it work to be a travel physician? Oh, so I'm actually living in Los Angeles, but my job is up in Fresno. Um, so with those jobs, because I was working three contracts at the same time, which was a big mistake, never more than two. Um, I was driving from where I live or flying to each work site, like flying up to San Francisco for a week and then coming back. With travel jobs, they put you in a hotel and pay for your travel. And they're harder because you're away from home and typically you're in a place where, you know, they're having trouble recruiting other doctors. But, you know, there are perks. You know, I don't have to work holidays if I don't want to. I don't have to go to all those meetings or do extra projects. When I go home, I'm home. And so they don't get to call me back in after I've done my one week or my two weeks. And so the rest of my schedule is mine. So I just went to Denmark a week ago just because, and <laughs> with my kid. And I went away for the weekend with some of my friends to like a writer's weekend and had a lot of fun. And when I come back, I'm going to have like a week and a half off where I just hang out with my kids. And so for me, it's kind of perfect because I have a lot of projects I'm trying to work on on the side. And I really missed a lot of my kids' years when I was going through training. And so now I get to spend more time with them. Here's another That's question. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on holistic review? Uh, many schools are saying that they are now looking at applications holistically. That's awesome. I wish that had been more available. If I had waited one or two more years to apply to medical school, I probably would have gotten into a U.S. school because they were starting to look more holistically probably around 2012, and I got in in 2010. But, you know, it worked out. I think holistically is better because I think there's a lot of people, again, who, you know, not to discredit them, but if the whole family is a doctor and they're applying to medical school, do they really know if they want to be a doctor? And then all of us, like, we're fighting for this with our whole heart for a reason. And each of us has a story about what brought us here. And so I kind of feel like we should get a chance, too. It shouldn't just be the legacies. I actually had a question. You mentioned that you would travel to Mexico to do, like, uh, at a clinic, right? Was it by mm -hmm. any chance Refugee Health Alliance or was it like a different organization? 
No, it was with Flying Samaritans. The refugee one is through um, one of the doctors at UCLA, right? Uh, Dr. Uh, Loise, right? Yeah. yeah, she's one of my friends. I haven't gone down though. <laughs> yeah, all right. Just so just, just curious. Community. <laughs> all of us girl doctors in California know each other. Thank you. There's also another organization that the, the, I think I think they called Angel Borders. Mm -hmm. I went there. Those border angels actually um, volunteered with them too. <laughs> I went down uh, once with them, and they're they're pretty cool people. Those are great trips, especially if you're trying to learn Spanish and eat really good tacos, and help people. Yeah, I I had mo more fun. Uh, I had a lot of fun um, hiking, meeting interesting people, eating really good food, and then cross the border back and forth a couple of times. And um, literally, like on a like, we would stop by somebody's house on the side, and they would make us food, and we would like you know give them dollars, and they were excited. So that was like that was a fun part of my trip. Juven, I think we've been through all the questions in the Q&A. We don't have any more open okay. right now. Anybody else have any other questions? I'll forever hold your... All right. Well, since we don't have any more, does anybody have any more questions? All righty. Well, thank you again for... Uh...